Can you hear me now? And, uh, this is the First United Methodist Church. <laughs> All right. Uh, you can sign up anytime and come here and visit us. And uh, John 6, verse 11 says, Jesus then took the loaves and he gave thanks and distributed them to those who were seated and they ate as much as they wanted. What a wonderful thought. The words, uh, the words of, of the Bible that gives us encouragement that when we come here, Jesus gives us the food and as much as we want. This Saturday at 8 o'clock uh, uh, in the morning will be the, the monthly men's breakfast. Uh, please keep that in mind. That starts at 8 o'clock uh, for all the gentlemen that likes to attend that. Uh, mark that on your calendar. Also, you see in your bulletin uh, this uh, um, tremendous love. I had to look at it for a second. And uh, we have tickets available for that. They'll be sold down in Fellowship Hall. Um, it's with the youth group, and, or not with the youth group, excuse me. It's, it's for church. And because the $5 that covers this, it's the church Christmas program with the kids. And they're having a matinee at 3 o'clock, and then they'll have an evening performance at 6 o'clock. And in between is a dinner. That's what the cost is. The $5 is, is for the meal, and, uh, and, and all the food is donated. So the profits that will be made will be uh, for items to, to, uh, for the gym and also for Sunday school supplies. And so uh, I hope, did I say that good enough, Lisa? Yes, uh, from the sta uh, Station House, Bell and Ed uh, donated all the food for this. So, uh, so we encourage you to come and, and purchase a ticket and so that way we know. Also, uh, peanut brittle will be sold following the Fellowship Hall. And uh, our, our peanut brittle will be sold in Fellowship Hall following the service. It's $5 a bag, and I hope that you will support the Seekers class for this. And John has a special one. For Paul. Paul? Paul? Wow. Glad I came. Thank you. you have to look at it. I will. <laughs> Peanut butter. <laughs> If you remember last week, uh, he said they're going to be making peanut butter. Well, <laughs> he got his peanut butter. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. By the way, the Seekers have been making peanut brittle since uh, 2001, and they have made over 1,477 pounds of peanut brittle, and all the donations has been back to the glory of God, and I think that's a wonderful thing that they do. Yeah. 7 o'clock tonight at the First Congregational Church will be the community Thanksgiving uh, service. Uh, we hope that you can join us uh, at, at the uh, uh, Congregational Church. If you did not get a loaf of bread when you, uh, when you first got here, and uh, for, for some reason, uh, oversight or that, please see Dennis or one of the ushers following the service, directly following the service, and he'll make sure that, that you get a loaf of bread. Um, is there any other ones that I missed? If not, uh, Pat. Good morning. As you can smell, Feed the Flock is being prepared as I speak. So everyone is welcome to come downstairs after worship for some really good food and fellowship. We're asking for a free will offering, but if for some reason or another you forgot your wallet this morning, you can come down anyway and we'll be glad to see you. Um, takeout orders are going to be available and we're looking forward to seeing you all downstairs. Thank you.
Thank you, Youth Chime Choir, for sharing your gifts with God and with us. Please turn in your hymnal to page 821 as we share in our call to worship responsibly. Page 821. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord who made us is God. We are the Lord's. We are the people of God, the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God's name. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's faithfulness to all generations. Our hymn of celebration this morning is number 101, From All That Dwell Below the Skies. Please stand as you're able and join in singing. pray. Eternal and gracious God, we come to you on this Sabbath day, a day of rest, a day of recreation, a day of worship, a day in which we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also a day in which we look forward to Thanksgiving Day and remember that this is a time for giving thanks. Help us to lift up our hearts in praise and adoration and in deep gratitude for the wonderful love you have given us in Jesus Christ and for the many ways in which you watch over and care for our lives each day of our lives in the power and in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Refresh us, renew us, send us forth from this place to serve you in all that we do. To your glory and to your honor, and in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please take a few moments to greet those around you today.
Church. <laughs> As you're being seated, please turn to the songbook in your pew, and we're going to sing pages 72 and 81. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord of the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I stand. Nothing prepares to the promise I have in you. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise his name. He is the Lord, forever his truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted, the ever exalted, and I will praise his name. He is the Lord, forever his truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I need a volunteer to carry the microphone around for us down here. check mark on the back of your bulletin. If you have a red check mark on the back of your bulletin, you have the opportunity to stand up and say, I am thankful for, and fill in the blank. We're going to start in this section right here. So if you have a red check mark on the back of your bulletin and you're willing to stand up and say, I am thankful for, and fill in the blank, just stand right up. Rick. Oh, we didn't. Is it turned on? Blue? Yeah, it was showing. There we go. Maybe. Hello? Okay. Yeah. My wife switched bulletins with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am thankful for, so far, a very healthy pregnancy. Uh, she's done very well, and uh, I thank God for this uh, blessing that he's given us and uh, look forward to the birth of our new child uh, any week now all right now the other ne the other new thing that we're going to do is as every person gets done saying i am thankful for and they fill in the blank the rest of us are going to say 
Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Okay. Anybody else in this section got a red mark? All the way around here, Lily. Red check mark on the back of your bulletin. I wondered what that was all about when I saw the red check mark. Okay, I'm thankful for my family and all of my church family. We love, I love it here. Thanks be to God. Anybody else in this section with a red check mark? All the way back here to Jerry. I likewise uh, am thankful for the church family that uh, is here today and around me. And I'm also very thankful that every day the woman that I've been married to has been experiencing much better health uh, since uh, July. It's been uh, a God bless. Thanks be to God. Anybody else in this section? Okay, we got one right here, Lily. I'm thankful for my family. Thanks be to God. Anybody else in this section with a red check mark and you're willing to share? Over here, you got a red check mark on the back of your bulletin and you're willing to say something. Karen. I am just thankful for everybody here at the church. God bless you all. Thanks be to God. Anybody else in this section? How about up in the balcony? Anybody in the balcony got a red check mark on the back of your bulletin and you're willing to share? I would just like to say that I'm thankful that yesterday my family got together and we celebrated my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. Thanks be to God. Gabe over here. Wait a minute, Gabe. Gabe, go, oh, go back over here first. It'll save you some running maybe. Maybe not. Can you go up to the... I'm thankful that I can serve God openly, and even though some people within the church and outside the church might think I'm a little different, that God loves me just how I am. Thanks be to God. All right, Louise over here, Gabe. I'm thankful for my good health and for my church family my relatives, and good friends that I have. Thanks be to God. Anybody else in the balcony with a red check mark on the back of your bulletin and you're willing to share something you're thankful for? All right, we're going to go to the choir. Anybody in the choir? Red check mark on the back of your bulletin and you're willing to share something, right? Oh, well, we got a couple here. I'm thankful because God gives, has given our family and myself the peace that no one or anybody else could have ever given. Thanks be to God. Just pass it back to Don, or Junior, rather. Yeah, I'm truly thankful for the many blessings God has bestowed on Pat and myself. And we're thankful for everything. Thanks be to God. John and I both got red checks. <laughs> I guess we're not good here. Um, I'm just thankful for two things, if I'm allowed. First, our daughter's pregnancy is going very well. We were very concerned when we found out it was twins because it is a high-risk pregnancy, and it's going very well. So for that, we're grateful. And I am also grateful that I have been given the opportunity these last many years to work with this wonderful group of people here with me up front. It has just been a pleasure, and God has really blessed me with the opportunity, and I thank you for that. Thanks be to God. John can't make up his mind. Well, she stole one of my thunders. So. <laughs> um, well, just thankful for family, for church family, and for all the blessings we've had here at this church. Thanks be to God. Anybody else in the choir? Okay, we've got one more up here. But I want to thank you, all of you out there. I called my nephew, Larry Raxter, last week, and I got him at home. And that's something that was amazing because he's been in the Veterans Hospital after his accident in June. He went back to work for a few hours on Friday. 
So that tells you his bone transplant and everything is working out good. And he said to tell you, he felt your prayers. He felt them. And I must tell you, Larry is a chaplain in the Army. And when he feels it, he feels it. Thank you very much. Thanks be to God. Anybody else, choir? Did we have somebody else back here? Is that, is that your, you're raising your hand there? <laughs> okay, we got one, got one back here. I'm very thankful for this lady that's sitting beside me and her whole family. Uh, they've taken me in when I really didn't have a whole lot, and I appreciate it, and I'm very thankful for it. Thanks be to God. Anybody else? Even if you don't have a red check mark, maybe we'll let you talk. Over here, Lily. Lily, we've got somebody all the way over here. I'm thankful for um, the ability to return to the Methodist Church and bring my mother and the warm welcome that we have received. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Anybody else? We're all the way in the back. With my condition, I am very grateful that I'm not in pain. And a hospice is a surprise because most people would be in pain what I'm going through. And through God, I am not. Thanks be to God. One more up here, Lily. Do you have a red check mark? No, I don't. Uh, you we'll, said I could we'll talk, let you talk anyway. We'll let you, know? you talk anyway. <laughs> I, am, se- I am really thankful and blessed that God has called me to be a servant and to be able to um, witness and to be able to help people in our community because we have a hurting community that we're in. And when you're in a position that you have to ask for assistance, when um, it's, it's a difficult time for a lot of people. And, when, and due to the fact of the job I have, that I'm able to be able to pray for them and to tell them that God loves them, I am blessed that I have that kind of a job. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Thank every one of you for your willingness to share your thanksgivings with us this morning. As we turn to our prayer concerns, we want to lift up the family of Barry Dorsey. Uh, Barry passed away earlier this past week, and uh, Alice, Alice's husband was a, uh, Barry's dad was Alice's husband's cousin, so Alice is related to that family. And then Linda Lewis, a friend of Amanda Trowbridge's, passed away as well. And then a couple of people that have been added to the other prayer list, Betty Brown, Pastor Dan Craig, and Tara Allen. Are there other prayer requests to be lifted up this morning? Joyce Mitchell, okay. Anyone else? Yes, I hear a voice. Martha, don't need to ask that we also pray for her cousin, Paul Walker, who's going to be having uh, heart surgery Monday. Martha Doning's cousin, Paul Walker, will be having heart surgery Monday. Any other prayer concerns? Let us be in prayer. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. We are aware, Father, that your blessings are so numerous that it would be simply impossible for us to count them all. And yet we don't want to be guilty of not counting them. 
of not being mindful of all the special blessings that you bestow upon us. First of all, we thank you, God, that you created each and every one of us. And as someone reminded me earlier this morning, you, has, you have given each one of us a purpose in life, a purpose as followers of Jesus Christ. You have uh, redeemed us in your Son, Jesus, and have given us a great, great, great salvation. You've given us the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, who guides our lives, who directs our lives, who gives us comfort, who walks along beside us as a comforter and as a counselor. You've given us the scriptures, the Bible, that guide and direct us in your ways of holiness and righteousness, and which reminds us and tells us the great story of your love in Jesus. And how, when your people go astray, you're constantly calling us back into yourself, wooing us, searching after us as a shepherd searches for a lost sheep, as a widow searches for a lost coin. God, you have given us the church. You've given us this particular congregation, people who love us and who care for us, people who rejoice when we rejoice, and people who weep when we weep together. But you've given us the larger church, the church in every time and in every place throughout all of the world, the church where we're able to proclaim the love of Jesus Christ so that others might come to faith in him. You have given us, God, a church family, but you've also placed us within families, people who love us, people who nurture us, people who nourish our lives. And you've provided food and shelter and the very basic necessities of life, and in many instances you have provided beyond the necessities of life to, that we might enjoy the greater fruits of your blessings. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you. Even as we remember the families who have lost loved ones in death this day, we also give you thanks that death is not the final word. That because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death has been overcome, death has been defeated. And the promise is that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And if he goes and prepares a place, he comes again and takes us unto himself that where he is, we might be also. Grant strength to each family, God, who has lost loved ones. And may they hear the promise of Jesus. I am the resurrection. I am life. We pray for those, God, on our prayer list, both who have physical needs as well as emotional, spiritual needs within their lives. May they know your healing. May they know your health. May they find renewed strength in your presence and in your care for their lives. And God, as we gather together later this week to celebrate Thanksgiving, may it indeed be a day of giving thanks. Getting together with family is good. Being able to enjoy a good meal is good. Being able to sit down afterwards and take a nap or watch a football game or to enjoy fellowship with each other is good. But help us, God, not to forget that it is a day of giving thanks unto you. Grant traveling mercies to all who will be traveling this week. May they have safe journeys. May they each be able to return home safely. God, there's so many other needs in our world. There's so many other things to give you thanks about. We just simply lift them all up unto you, praising your holy name, trusting in your love. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As our ushers prepare to receive our morning offering, hear these words from the 11th chapter of Psalms. In the Lord I take refuge, for the Lord is righteous, he loves justice, upright people will see the Lord's face. the joy of ear and eye, for the heart and mind's delight, for the mystic harmony, linking sense to sound and sight. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. 
for the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends of earth and friends above, for the gentle thoughts and mind. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Lord, we love you because you first loved us and gave your Son, Jesus Christ, for us. Because we love you, we bring these gifts, asking that you would bless them and that you would use them, asking that your Holy Spirit would go before them and follow them, that your great love may be spread throughout our community, throughout our nation, and around our world. Because we spread your love, may others come to love you as well. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
it is time for the children to go to junior church, and as they're going, we will sing hymn number 143 as they are going. 147. 147. Verse 3. Verse 3, thank you. <laughs> Debbie's got me all off kilter today. Thing bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The cold wind in the winter, the pleasant summer sun, the ripe fruits in garden, God made them every one. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made. This is going to be a surprise to the ushers, but ushers, I need you. So if I could have my ushers come up front. Ushers, if you'll come up front. And if somebody in the back in the balcony will serve as an usher. If you, today is Consecration Sunday, and if you forgot to bring your card with you, or you need a duplicate card, we're going to provide you with one. So the ushers are going to go down through the aisles. Just pass the plates. If you need a card, take one. If somebody in the balcony will pass that uh, plate up there around, go right ahead. Just... If you need a card for later in the service, please take one. If you need two cards, take two. I didn't make enough for every single person to have one. Anybody in the choir need one? Just in case. But it should be enough. If you forgot to bring yours, for you to get one. Yes, it'll help if I get my Bible. In case you haven't figured out the themes for uh, the... the uh, chorus after the, the uh, offering and the children's uh, going to church uh, <coughs> song are both kind of Thanksgiving songs as we think about that. So that's kind of the theme we've been having throughout this month. Our scripture lesson is going to be from Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 11 to 25. And ushers, when you get to the back, you can just keep the plates and stuff back there. That won't hurt a thing. Thank you very much. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. The author is writing about Jesus being a high priest. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers and sisters... 
Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. You may recall that two weeks ago the sermon was about stewardship in its broadest context. And I ended by saying that stewardship is really a form of thanksgiving, of giving thanks. Everything that God has entrusted to us is God's. And we are merely stewards of all that we have whether it's material, financial things, whether it's our health, whether it's the earth and the world that surrounds us, everything that is around us and everything that we often consider to be ours is really God's. And to be thankful (laughs) means to be faithful stewards. Last week I shared with you that from my perspective, the biblical standard for all Christians is for us to tithe in terms of our financial giving. And personally, I know there's a lot of people who disagree with this, but personally I believe that our tithe is to support our local church, the congregation, the place where we get fed in our spiritual growth and in our spiritual nurture. And this morning I'm going to talk a little bit more specific about the process of consecration and the process of that card that you have or that you brought with you today. I have to tell you that I've struggled with this sermon probably more than any other sermon at least in recent weeks and months that I've had because there's been a lot of stuff going on in my mind. And sometimes the hard part about sermons is not coming up with ideas, it's trying to figure out which ideas to exclude. From the sermon. And I'm still not sure that I've got that sorted out. We'll see how it goes. I trust that I will say what God wants you to hear. There was a cow and a pig that were, no, a cow and a chicken. Cow and a pig's a different story. There was a cow, (laughs) there was a cow and a chicken. And they were discussing their contributions to a breakfast. And the chicken said, well, I provide eggs for the breakfast. And the pig said, well, I provide bacon and sausage and ham for the breakfast. And the chicken said, yeah, but I can keep providing eggs and keep providing eggs and keep providing eggs. Once you provided your ham or your sausage or your bacon, that's all there is. You can't provide anymore. I can keep pumping out eggs every day for the next several years. And the pig said, yeah, that's right. Except your contribution to the breakfast is just that, a contribution. Mine is a full commitment to the breakfast. Somebody raised the question, If we don't sign our cards and we're going to stick them in the shredder and they're just going to be shredded, how is the church going to know how to build their budget? Because lots of times, some churches, they don't build their budget until they get their pledge cards back in. When they find out how much people are going to pledge, then they kind of build their budget around the amounts of pledges that they receive. Now, I've been in some churches where uh, most of the time the pledges don't 
match up to what the budget's going to be. And that's the case here. I haven't been here very long, but my understanding is that at least in recent years, the amount of pledges that have come in in the fall during the pledge campaign, during the consecration Sunday, has been about 75% to 80% of what the budget turns out to be. So it's very difficult for us to build a budget based upon what people's pledges have been. So we really don't take that into consideration when we build our budget. Some will say, well, how come we build a budget more than what the pledges are? And the answer is to that is because we believe we are fulfilling the ministry that God has entrusted to us as a congregation. Amen. And we want to dream a little bit higher and set our standards a little bit higher in terms of the ministries that we want to provide for our congregation and for our community. Someone else said, well... Why are we shredding these cards? And then if we want the church to keep track of what our pledge is and then how we're coming along with meeting that pledge, we've got to provide a second card then for joy. That seems like a waste. Well, I guess in some ways you could consider it a waste. But our emphasis this morning is not you pledging for the purpose of the church. Our emphasis is that your pledge, your commitment, is between you and God. Amen. You're not making a commitment between you and the church. You're making a commitment between you and God. And that's what all four of those commitments are. On the commitment card, you'll see that there's actually four things on the front side of that. And they reflect the membership vows. Membership vows when you become a member of the United Methodist Church. And maybe you haven't taken the membership vows, but the fact that you're here every Sunday kind of ties you in there. It says, I will support the church with my prayers, my presence, my service, and my gifts. Now, admittedly, the card tends to focus on the commitment to your gifts. But you're also being asked to make a commitment about the other three items, your prayers, your presence, and your service. I have to admit to you that I read some information a couple of weeks ago that disturbed me. If you didn't get the point from last week's sermon on tithing, let me remind you, or say it more clearly. I said it already once this morning. My belief, and admittedly, I'm an idealistic person when it comes to this, and I'm idealistic about some other things when it comes to our spiritual life, is that the biblical standard is that we should give our tithe unto God, 10%. That that belongs to God. It really doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And therefore, I kind of think if it was up to me, we wouldn't be having these commitment consecration Sundays. Because we'd all be tithing. We'd all be reading our Bibles every day like I believe we all should. We would all be praying every day. And the only sermons that I would have to preach on this is, is the, basically the other kinds of sermons that I preach about reading your Bible every day and praying every day and supporting the work of God with our finances and with our service, etc. But sometimes I read things that remind me that my idealism sometimes doesn't get conveyed to others. There was a survey done back in the late 1990s, and among the findings, it said that better programs, the better your financial campaign stewardship program is, the better, the more giving people will give to the church. Better programs are associated with higher giving. That bothered me. It bothers me because I think if we're tithing, if we're given what God says we should give, it shouldn't matter what kind of program you got. 
We should simply be giving because God has given to us. Churches that emphasize giving to God receive lower per capita giving. I, I read that the other day and I thought, well, maybe that explains why every church that I've been to the last several churches of my life were always seems to be struggling financially. Because I'm always emphasizing giving to God. And it says churches that emphasize giving to God receives lower per capita giving. And then it said giving is greater when members are convinced the church has financial difficulties. Well, again, that bothers me. Because again, I don't think we should be giving because the church has the need to receive as much as we have the need to give. Now granted, we are a very fortunate congregation. If you read your bulletin, it says we're $11,000 below in what we've received for the year in our budget over what we need in our budget. But we're fortunate that over the years we've had people who have left money to the church in their estate and we have some reserve funds and even though we haven't received the money in to meet the budget we'll get everything paid this year because we have reserve funds that we can pull from and so in that sense we don't have financial difficulties Except it doesn't take a genius to realize that if you're continually, continually pulling from reserve funds, eventually those reserve funds will disappear. And then you can really find yourself in a world of hurt. This one was interesting. Members who read the Bible more contribute more. You don't want to contribute very much to the church? Well, don't read the Bible. That's an antidote to giving. Don't read the Bible, and you won't, may not give as much. Uh, maybe I need to preach more on reading the Bible more, and then that will result in bigger contributions. The use of pledge cards increases giving. Again, I scratch my head, and I wonder why. Because if we're given to God, and if we're given because of what God has done in Jesus Christ, it shouldn't matter if we use pledge cards or we don't use pledge cards. We're given to God. But it seems to me that my logic doesn't seem logical to a lot of other people. Well, now that I've got that off my chest, some people will say, Paul, you quit preaching a long time ago and started meddling. <laughs> I know some people who don't think the preacher should talk about money. And I'm not talking about money. Well, yeah, I am. But I'm talking about our spiritual maturity. Some will say that if we grow in our spiritual maturity, we'll give more, which is possibly true. But I want to suggest to you that the adverse is also true, that if we give more, we may also find ourselves growing spiritually more mature. We can grow in our giving and we can grow through our giving. In that chapter from Hebrews, chapter 10, Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having us bodies, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deed. Let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. Amen. There's this exhortation 
to grow in our faith in these passages. There's that exhortation for us to make sacrifices. As I shared last week, some people, some Christians who tithe, don't find that to be a sacrifice. Because they believe that's what God wants and they experience that God provides for their every need. So to give the tithe isn't necessarily a sacrifice to them. For many other people in their giving, it feels like a sacrifice to them. It seems like to them that they're having to give up something in order to make their contributions to God. But that's exactly what we're called to do here in Hebrews is to make sacrifices. To be willing to make sacrifices. Sacrifices of our time, our effort, our energy, our finances. To sacrifice ourselves. Paul wrote to the church at Romans, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable. Let us offer ourselves as living sacrifices unto God. Why? Well, in the first part of the passage that I read, it talks about Jesus' sacrifice. First, sacrifices and our offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings. Oh, no, I started in the wrong spot. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus Christ, the high priest, offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. This is the covenant I will make with them. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. You and I are called to make sacrifices to follow Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ has sacrificed his life for us. Made the ultimate sacrifice. So that we don't have to bring in animals and kill them and spread their blood around as a sacrifice as they did in the Old Testament because Jesus Christ offered himself once and for all as a sacrifice for each and every one of us. And because Jesus sacrificed himself for us, we can make sacrifices. To support God's church with our prayers, our presence, our service, and our offerings. Ben Witherington wrote that Christians have infinite how-to manuals on marriage, money, sex, and everything else. But I don't see much of what I read in 1 Corinthians 7, which speaks of sitting lightly with what we have with a sense of detachment. Money, for example, is God's, not ours. We didn't bring our pink Cadillac into the world, and we can't take it with us to the new kingdom, even if we get buried with it. We are simply stewards of God's property, which should change the whole way we look at the concept of ownership and how it relates to the mission of the church or evangelism. Well, a pig and a cow were having a conversation. Pig looked at the cow and said, I just don't get it. People look at you with admiration. You've got those big cow eyes, and people look into those big cow eyes, and they're just enamored. And they take you on as pets, and they come out, and they pat you, and they spend time with you. Oh, I know. You give milk every day. You provide them with milk. But hey, I provide them with sausage and ham and bacon. I just don't understand why people don't have more respect for me than they do for you. And the cow looked at him and said, Well, maybe that's because I give while I'm living instead of waiting until I die. 
May we each give unto God while we're living. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. This morning, you are invited to come forward. We're going to start with the choir, and then we'll start with the front pews, and you'll come in, come down the center aisle. And if you care to shred your card, you'll place it in the shredder and then just return to your seats. If you do want Joy Bays, our financial secretary, to have a record of your commitment, your pledge, and you want her to track that for you, please place your card in one of the baskets that is provided there in the altar rail. God, as we ponder our commitments unto you, commitments that in some ways we don't just make this day for the next year, but commitments that we make every day, Every day we promise that we are going to pray for your church. Not just this congregation, but for your church. Every day, God, we promise that we are going to be present. Maybe not every time that the church doors are opened, but that we're going to come. We're going to gather with the other Christians to worship you on Sunday morning. We might come back for a Bible study or for a small group study of some kind or another. Every day we seek to serve you, both within the life of the congregation and outside within the life of our community. And every day, God, we commit that we're going to be responsible stewards of all that you have entrusted unto us. And so, God, as each of us think about and each of us pray about how we're going to complete the consecration card this morning, fill us with your spirit, guide our thoughts, guide our actions, guide our decisions, and then give us the courage, give us the strength to live every day as faithful followers of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, as you come, you can come as a family group, or you can send up one representative of your family. I'm not too uh, particular about that, but we're going to start with the choir right now. And uh, we'll, as the choir comes through, then we'll invite the congregation to come forward. Would you please come? and bring your consecration cards with you. Oh. The stewardship program is the better, the more giving people will give to the church. Better programs are associated with higher giving. That bothered me. It bothers me because I think if we're tithing, if we're given what God says we should give, it shouldn't matter what kind of program you got. We should simply be giving because God has given to us. Churches that emphasize giving to God receive lower per capita giving. I, I read that the other day and I thought, well, maybe that explains why every church that I've been to the last several churches of my life were always seems to be struggling financially. Because I'm always emphasizing giving to God. And it says, churches that emphasize giving to God receives lower per capita giving. And then it said, giving is greater when members are convinced the church has financial difficulties. 
Well, again, that bothers me. Because, again, I don't think we should be giving because the church has the need to receive as much as we have the need to give. Now, granted, we are a very fortunate congregation. You read your bulletin, it says we're $11,000 below in what we've received for the year in our budget over what we need in our budget. But we're fortunate that over the years we've had people who have left money to the church in their estate and we have some reserve funds. And even though we haven't received the money in to meet the budget, we'll get everything paid this year because we have reserve funds that we can pull from. And so in that sense, we don't have financial difficulties, except it doesn't take a genius to realize that if you're continually, continually pulling from reserve funds, eventually those reserve funds will disappear. And then you can really find yourself in a world of hurt. This one was interesting. Members who read the Bible more contribute more you don't want to contribute very much to the church well don't read the bible that's a antidote to giving don't read the bible and you won't may not give as much uh, maybe i need to preach more on reading the bible more and then that'll result in bigger contributions the use of pledge cards increases giving Again, I scratch my head and I wonder why. Because if we're given to God, and if we're given because of what God has done in Jesus Christ, it shouldn't matter if we use pledge cards or we don't use pledge cards. We're given to God. But it seems to me that my logic doesn't seem logical to a lot of other people. Well, now that I've got that off my chest... Some people will say, Paul, you quit preaching a long time ago and started meddling. <laughs> I know some people who don't think the preacher should talk about money. And I'm not talking about money. Well, yeah, I am. But I'm talking about our spiritual maturity. Some will say that if we grow in our spiritual maturity, we'll give more. Which is possibly true. But I want to suggest to you that the adverse is also true. That if we give more, we may also find ourselves growing spiritually more mature. We can grow in our giving and we can grow through our giving. In that chapter from Hebrews, chapter 10. Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having us bodies, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deed. Let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. Amen. There's this exhortation to grow in our faith in these passages. There's that exhortation for us to make sacrifices. As I shared last week, some people, some Christians who tithe, don't find that to be a sacrifice. Because they believe that's what God wants and they experience that God provides for their every need. So to give the tithe isn't necessarily a sacrifice to them. For many other people in their giving, it feels like a sacrifice to them. It seems like to them that they're having to give up something in order to make their contributions to God. But that's exactly what we're called to do here in Hebrews is to make sacrifices. 
to be willing to make sacrifices, sacrifices of our time, our effort, our energy, our finances, to sacrifice ourselves. Paul wrote to the church at Romans, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable. Let us offer ourselves as living sacrifices unto God. Why? Well, in the first part of the passage that I read, it talks about Jesus' sacrifice. First, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings. Oh, I started in the wrong spot. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest... Jesus Christ, the high priest, offered for all time one sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. This is the covenant I will make with them. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their mind. You and I are called to make sacrifices to follow Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ has sacrificed his life for us. Made the ultimate sacrifice. So that we don't have to bring in animals and kill them and spread their blood around. As a sacrifice as they did in the Old Testament because Jesus Christ offered himself once and for all as a sacrifice for each and every one of us. And because Jesus sacrificed himself for us, we can make sacrifices to support God's church with our prayers, our presence, our service, and our offerings. Ben Witherington wrote that Christians have infinite how-to manuals on marriage, money, sex, and everything else. But I don't see much of what I read in 1 Corinthians 7, which speaks of sitting lightly with what we have with a sense of detachment. Money, for example, is God's, not ours. We didn't bring our pink Cadillac into the world And we can't take it with us to the new kingdom, even if we get buried with it. We are simply stewards of God's property, which should change the whole way we look at the concept of ownership and how it relates to the mission of the church or evangelism. Well, a pig and a cow were having a conversation. Pig looked at the cow and said, I just don't get it. People look at you with admiration. You've got those big cow eyes, and people look into those big cow eyes, and they're just enamored. And they take you on as pets, and they come out, and they pat you, and they spend time with you. Oh, I know, you give milk every day. You provide them with milk. But hey, I provide them with sausage and ham and bacon. I just don't understand why people don't have more respect for me than they do for you. And the cow looked at him and said, well, maybe that's because I give while I'm living instead of waiting until I die. May we each give unto God while we're living. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. This morning, you are invited to come forward. We're going to start with the choir, and then we'll start with the front pews, and you'll come in, come down the center aisle. And if you care to shred your card, you'll place it in the shredder and then just return to your seats. If you do want Joy Bays, our financial secretary, to have a record of your commitment, your pledge, and you want her to track that for you, please place your card in one of the baskets that is provided there in the 
altar rail. God, as we ponder our commitments unto you, commitments that in some ways we don't just make this day for the next year, but commitments that we make every day. Every day we promise that we are going to pray for your church. Not just this congregation, but for your church. Every day, God, we promise that we are going to be present. Maybe not every time that the church doors are opened, but that we're going to come. We're going to gather with the other Christians to worship you on Sunday morning. We might come back for a Bible study or for a small group study of some kind or another. Every day we seek to serve you both within the life of the congregation and outside within the life of our community. And every day, God, we commit that we're going to be responsible stewards of all that you have entrusted unto us. And so, God, as each of us think about and each of us pray about how we're going to complete the consecration card this morning, Fill us with your spirit, guide our thoughts, guide our actions, guide our decisions, and then give us the courage, give us the strength to live every day as faithful followers of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Now, as you come, you can come as a family group or you can send up one representative of your family. I'm not too uh, particular about that, but we're going to start with the choir right now. And uh, we'll, as the choir comes through, then we'll invite the congregation to come forward. Would you please come and bring your consecration cards with you? <laughs> 